So could you tell us about the phone call about um, scheduling her surgery after she had passed away? That was absolutely surreal because I've been there and done that before. I remember answering the phone and somebody on the other end saying, this is the, the uh, cath lab calling from Scarborough. We're looking for somebody named Shannon Anderson. And I said, excuse me, like, you know, what are you talking about? Well, she missed her appointment for the 9th of March. We have it all set up. She's coming in. She's going to have the Cardi version. I really lost it on the phone. I just said, you have to be kidding me. She died like five days ago. So you know what? Conversation didn't end very well. I think I ended up hanging up on her. I was that devastated. It took a long time just to get a hold of myself. Judy Anderson from Ontario, Canada, recently lost her daughter, Shannon, while she waited for heart surgery. Shannon's death was entirely preventable. Incredibly, this is the second time Judy has lost a daughter after having to wait too long for surgery. Today, she shares her story. My name is Judy Anderson and I'm a retired registered nurse and I live up in Port Perry, Ontario. Shannon's story actually started about 20 years ago when she started exhibiting signs of a family inherited uh, cardiac illness. Um, and it, eventually she started showing enough signs during her third pregnancy. We went through the route of, of doing the uh, implantable ICD, so she had a pacemaker defibrillator in for prevention of sudden death. But then she started developing the other part of cardiomyopathy, and that's the congestive heart failure. And it progressed and it progressed, and she was on a lot of different medications for it. Um, at the end of the day, when I took her to the doctors in January, mid-January, it was because she wasn't feeling well. And he said, yes, you've got changes. You might get into this weird particular rhythm called atrial fib. If so, we'll treat it. But because of COVID, you're going to have a four-week wait in order to get that particular procedure done. Then the cardiologist offered her a second idea. We'll get another opinion. We'll do something called an ablation. So she waited at home. To get that phone call from this particular doctor, she waited until the end of February. He told her, he said, it's a year wait. And she just, she was absolutely beside herself. She thought, you know what, mom, I'm gonna die. I, I feel like I'm, I'm on my last legs. Uh, she called her children over and had the last minute conversations with them. So that was a Friday. So Friday and Saturday, she kind of said her goodbyes to her family. And Sunday morning, she called the ambulance. She went in, she was admitted. Uh, they found multiple things wrong with her at that particular point, depleted levels of potassium and, and whatnot. Within 24 hours of that admission, she coded. She got a bed in the, in the intensive care unit and she died three days later. They waited far too long and she knew, she had that premonition that this was the end for her and it was tragic, you know, what it could have been prevented. Like, see her, do what needs to be done, save a life and it wasn't done. Shannon's story is truly tragic, but this isn't the first time Judy has experienced family tragedy due to long waiting lists. My younger daughter at the age of 10 was, she had an irregular uh, heart rate. She had a little bit of a, a murmur. We just happened to take her to a doctor that was dealing with her migraine headaches. And I mentioned to him, I said, you know, I've noticed this murmur or whatever, it's quite different. And being a cardiologist, he examined her and he came back and he did a whole series of tests on her that day. And he said, this is extremely serious. I'm going to send all these files and information down to Sick Children's Hospital. She needs to be seen right away. We need to get her into the operating room. And he did that. He sent all the files in. He got an answer back saying from Sick Kids, she's not symptomatic enough. She's an active 10 year old girl and we'll bring her in when we have the facilities to do that. Two weeks later, she died of a cardiac arrest, putting on her pair of ice skates. There are a few important takeaways from Judy's story. First, thousands of non-COVID patients have suffered since the pandemic began. Secondstreet.org obtained government data showing upwards of 400,000 non-COVID procedures and surgeries were postponed due to COVID. We can't forget that many of these patients suffered while governments focused on COVID-19. Second, the data shows that there is less patient suffering in countries that have both public health care systems and non-government health care options. Countries with both options also have more doctors, beds, and other health resources available to battle pandemics in other periods when demand is high. 
governments could be a lot more transparent about patient suffering in our healthcare system. If you would like to see our healthcare research and the data governments have provided to us, please visit secondstreet.org.